those two months that I spent in an incubator, back then when, when the babies were not taken out and held and touched, now if you see, if you see premature babies, they do what's called kangaroo care. They find a way to attach all those tubes and wires to the baby and still have the baby next to the parent's chest. My parents were not allowed to pick me up, to touch me or anything during those two months that I struggled to breathe. My Everything else was fine. My weight was fine. I just could not get my breathing sorted out. Um, I do believe that had an impact on my my development. And I see later, as I said, I was born in 75. My parents listened to the Eagles, the Beatles, you know, all of that sort of music. I remember being in the car with them and listening to these songs and really zeroing in on anything that talked about abandonment, anything that talked about rejection, anything that talked about leaving you, being left. And of course, a lot of these songs were sung by men to girls. Of course, my only frame of reference is girls, you know? And what I'm hearing is, you're going to be left. You're going to be abandoned, particularly by men. At the time, all I knew was I was very scared. I was very scared of being left. My father worked a lot, was out of the house a lot. My mother was a stay-at-home parent, and she struggled with alcoholism. And even though I had that sort of environment, my relationship with my mother was fairly volatile. My even other family members will say we never really got along, that our relationship was always very tense. Even in that environment, I remember going away to camp, an overnight camp for you know five days, and being so homesick. Because even though my home life was not stable, it was all I knew. And I couldn't stand the separation. I couldn't stand the separation of being so far from home. When I was 13, my parents separated. My father had told my mother that she needed to stop drinking. She needed to deal with the alcoholism and that if she didn't, that he would need to leave. And he left uh, within a couple of months, my mother was arrested for drunk driving, and uh, within a couple of weeks of that, did to go to rehab to deal with the alcoholism. My sister and I were the two children. I have an older sister, and we were sent you know, to friends of the family in town uh, to stay while my mother went to rehab. When she got out of the rehab, we continued to go to aftercare and Al-Anon, 12-step meetings and things like that, but she did start drinking again uh, within six months probably. And um, after a certain period, I just, I put down my foot and I said, I can't live here anymore. Because of the court proceedings, my father was able to get temporary custody and we were able to move back into my home growing up. Um, so I was 14 at this time, really. I think at the time I would have said, I thought this was the best thing that could happen, you know? Um, I, I never got along with my mother. I did not want to live with my mother. I wanted to live with my father. But if you look at pictures of me and, and the thing, you can see some of the insecurity I was experiencing, even the way my clothing changed, the way I dressed. Uh, I started wearing much more looser clothing. I lost weight, um, began struggling with an eating disorder at this time. But I would have said, you know, this is great. I can't wait for my parents to, to be done and be divorced. Going into my freshman year of high school, and I made a friend with another girl who was in band. I was in the band and in the chorus and doing music and all of that. And uh, we became very close friends, eventually two close friends, I can say with perspective. And at a certain point, I realized that I was physically attracted to her. I we did enter into a sexual relationship when I was 15, so at the end of my freshman year of high school. And I remember getting a health book. I can't remember if it was from the library or my sister had one of those, you know, sexuality type books that your parents give you, you know, just hand the book to you and 
until you read it. Um, I know she had one, but I, I may have checked one out of the library. And I remember reading in that book, as I was trying to make sense of what was going on, if you have feelings for you know, someone of your gender, and especially if you act on them, then you're gay. And I remember just thinking, there it is, in black and white. I'm a homosexual. And I felt two things in that moment. First of all, I felt like all of a sudden everything made sense. The things that I had experienced from a young age, I never experimented sexually with boys. <laughs> it was always girls from a young age. Other things that I'd experienced in life. And on the other side, it felt like a death sentence. I just, this, this is 1990. I lived in a small town in New Hampshire. No one famous came out of the closet for another <laughs> almost decade, you know, five to seven years. I mean, I remember specifically when I share my story, sometimes I say, Ellen didn't come out for another seven years. Like, it's hard to imagine that world existed, you know, but it did. It, I knew that being a gay person where I lived, which was all I really knew of the world, you know, where I lived was, was not... <laughs> not going to be a fun experience. I didn't want to be gay. I, 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 didn't, I didn't want that. Even though I was not raised in a conservative home at all, in fact, after a certain point, the girl, my girlfriend's mother found out about our relationship. Now, my girlfriend's mother was a lesbian. She found out about our relationship, and she called my father and said, we need to have a meeting. And so my dad came over to my girlfriend's house, and we all sat around this table, and my girlfriend's mother said to him, our daughters are gay. Our daughters are in a relationship together. And she paused. And my dad said, so? Like, and? What's the point? My father, uh, the next day, left me a card on the counter. And I'll never forget the card. It was a cow's head. Like, you know, this is the eyes, this is the nose. And when you opened it, it was the inside of the cow's mouth. And it just, he just wrote on there, I love you, Dad. He just wanted me to know that that wasn't going to change. Um, it was a very, very powerful moment. He's still, he's still that way. I knew Christians thought gay people would go to hell. I probably, I remember seeing some, what I would consider at the time, fanatical Christians on Donahue or Oprah and thinking, okay, that's what they think. They think that I'm going to go to hell. And I had one Christian friend in high school, and we didn't talk about it. I went to college for two years in my area, studied music. My girlfriend and I broke up. I ended up meeting another woman who I didn't think was gay. I had no reason to think she had those feelings um, because she was married. And eventually we ended up in a relationship as well. And I was in that relationship for three and a half years. So eventually she and I decided I should go back to school, actually went to school where she had gone to school, a music school here in Boston, New England Conservatory of Music. And we, we broke up as well. Our relationship ended at some point during my first year there. My eating disorder started to get really bad. I had been in treatment since I was 19. At this point, I was 23, uh, seeing specialists, all sorts of people for my eating disorder. And I, I had a particularly difficult day where I realized I'm doing all these things to recover, and I'm not recovering. <laughs> And all of a sudden, in a moment, I, I thought, I, I could die. Like, this could really kill me. So I called a friend of mine who'd been in recovery from alcoholism for a decade. And she, raised Catholic, practicing Hindu now, said, well, have you tried praying? And I said, no. That's probably the only thing I haven't done. And so I prayed, God, make me want to get better. And in, during this time, someone had given me 
a, a Christian CD and a biography of a Christian singer. I had been meeting all these Christians at school, people that I didn't even know were Christians. I had lost a considerable amount of weight, so people were coming up to me and saying, are you okay? You know, do you have cancer or something? I said, no, I have an eating disorder. Um, and people just saying, you know what, they were gonna pray for me. They, they knew I was gay. They never said to me, you're going to hell because of your behavior. You're going to hell because you're gay. They just said, you know what, I know Jesus and I can pray for you and share, share him with you. So one night I was listening to this CD that somebody had given me and looking at this book and it just started to make sense. It started to make sense that the song talked about a friend who was there with every tear cried, a friend who would give up everything for, for me. And I thought, as this man sang about Jesus, not even really saying his name, I, I said, I believe to God, I want what he has. I want what he has. And I believe God honored that prayer. That was January of 1999. I didn't, I didn't have an immediate conviction that my life needed to change. Some things changed by themselves. Other things uh, took more time. I did have one more lesbian relationship at the end of, end of that year for three months. And I really wrestled during that time. I really felt like I had a choice. Throughout my first college that I went to, my relationship with this married woman, even into the, pr the present at that time, I had really built my identity around being gay. I was very active in the gay community. Um, and I didn't know who Brenna was without being gay. And I felt like the Bible was clear. I could not continue to live the way that I was living and follow Jesus with my whole heart. And I couldn't choose. I felt like I had a choice. Continue in your gay identity or let Jesus give me a new identity. And I couldn't pick. And so my girlfriend broke up with me. Brenna, you can't be a Christian and be gay. <laughs> God wants you to be either hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, he is going to spit you out of his mouth. So we have to break up. Now, she was not following Jesus <laughs> at the time. She would have not said she was a Christian, though she was raised in a Christian home. This is what she said to me. And I said, OK, see you later. And I just immediately had a conviction. I was done, done. And when she came back a week later and wanted to get back together, I said, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. I'm going to do, do my best to walk in what I believe is obedience to God's word wherever that takes me. Lord, my heart is not proud And my eyes are not arrogant I do not concern myself With things too marvelous for me God is just really gracious. There were so many things that I struggled with, even in how I viewed him, 
that he was so patient in dismantling in my life and extending his hand of kindness when I, with my thoughts and behaviors, at times would turn my back on him. Um, he was quick to reassure me that he wasn't a parent who would reject me, that he would never abandon me, and, and to tell me how sad it made him as my father when I treated him as if he would do those things, when I treated him as if I had to walk on eggshells around him, when I treated him as if at any moment he was going to explode and strike me down, you know, figuratively, if at any moment, I, you know, one false move and the walls would come crumbling down because that's the world I grew up in. In fact, I, I believe in my life I created chaos because chaos was familiar. <laughs> and so in my relationship with God, too, I created chaos because chaos was familiar. And God just patiently told me to rest in him, stop striving, rest in him, and to, to allow him to show me what freedom really looked like, because I believed freedom looked like behaving a certain way. I did go to counseling. I went and saw a fantastic Christian counselor who really helped me sort through some of my identity issues. Um, she taught me the power, in, in, not a in not a positive sense, but the power that my thought patterns had in my life. That even if I wasn't behaving a certain way, even if my behavior lined up with what God's word says, how God's word says I should live, that that wasn't it, that my thought patterns still made me hate myself, um, hypercritical of everything I thought and did, uh, that my, my thought patterns really kept me from really experiencing God's freedom. And in the midst of that, I, I did meet uh, a man who was not intimidated or anything by the fact that I had quite a history. Um, he, we met through the campus ministry that I was involved in and um, had quite a long road of dating, but did eventually marry. I've been married about nine and a half years now. I have slowly been able to see and receive all of the ways that God is a good father. One of the main things that God showed me is that trust is a choice, that, uh, that every day I can choose to trust in what I know about God's character. Whereas I used to act as if I believed in my head all these things about God's character, that he was good, that he was faithful, slow to anger, all these, you know, abounding in love and faithfulness but I acted as if none of those things were true. So God showed me that I can choose to trust him. And choosing to trust him means in a situation where I don't understand what he could possibly be doing, <laughs> that I can choose to believe he is good and act as if he is good, um, rather than going into my head and trying to figure out 57 ways I can fix this situation I can breathe, I can exhale and say, God, I'm going to wait on you, I'm going to trust in you, I'm going to do what I know to do until you reveal something else to me, but I'm going to choose to believe that you are good. And God has, has shown himself to be good. I always think of the story of Joshua um, crossing the Jordan River, first, first of all, it was at flood, it was flood season. And the amazing difference in the story of Joshua crossing the Jordan and the story of Moses crossing the Red Sea is that the water for Moses parted ahead of him. And for the story of Joshua, God told them to step into the water at flood, flood stage. And at the end of the crossing, um, God told them to set up stones of remembrance. Um, so that for generations, people would know about God's faithfulness in that situation. And in my life, 
because my emotions are so fickle, I have set up stones of remembrance to remind myself of all the times that God has been faithful and all the times God has act, acted as he said he would. Um, and I've also learned to trust in who he is simply because of what the word says and who he's shown me to be rather than focusing so much on what I see him doing because again, the way that I view things and my perspective can be all over the place. I've heard it said that Corey Ten Boom said, faith is trusting in the character of God when life gives you reasons not to. And I have not been able to find where she said that, but I feel like that has been, that was and still is almost my mantra for years and years. Life will always give you reasons to doubt God's character. I don't know at that point if I had heard of ex-gays, you know, I don't know if I knew people who had um, left behind homosexuality or left behind a gay identity. And I was directed towards the ministry Alive in Christ here in Boston uh, that they needed a women's leader. So I went once and uh, nine plus years later, I'm still there. Um, after about a year and a half, they asked me if I would consider being the director and I accepted that position. So that was seven and a half years ago. We mainly, our main ministry is a weekly support group for Christian men and women who struggle with same-sex attraction. We also have a monthly support group for friends and family who are impacted by the issues of same-sex attraction. And we, our, our groups are both men and women together. We have leaders for the men, male leaders for the men, female leaders for the women, and partway through the meeting we split into small groups and discuss things more in depth. We study a variety of materials, including uh, you know, books, DVD series, whatever. In fact, I've written a, a short book uh, called Learning to Walk in Freedom, and we're going to study that next. Stilled and quieted my soul Like a child with its mother Is my soul with my father Like a child I just encourage you to ask. Ask that God would send the reassurance of his spirit to let you know that he loves you. Like I prayed, I prayed, I want what that guy has, that guy who's singing. As you see me sing, say, God, if you're real, give me a glimpse of what she has. Jesus loves you. God spared no expense so that you can Know God as your Father. I just encourage you today to ask. Ask. He, he, he challenges us in the Word. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in Him. And I just encourage you to take refuge in Him today. Thank you. <laughs>